So here we are guys, back in sunny LA. I mean, look at this. What a change from that terrible rain we've been having in the UK. Um, but as pleasant as it is, I've got a huge job ahead of me here. Remember last time we started on Dan's Mercedes 190 SL. It's a 1958, it's a beautiful car. The problem was we realized it's been off the road for about 24 years. So it needs basically everything. Uh, it was a bit bitty last time. I mean, we got our hands on the fuel system, the tank, the fuel filter, put new carburetors on. I started on the braking system. We put new ignition leads on, new spark plugs. But basically the car needs everything. But if anything, the good thing last time was we were able to make a checklist and plan for the job ahead. So this time, rather than driving around for bits of tools and, you know, saw some bits, we can hit the ground running. And hopefully, fingers crossed, get this job finished and make Dan a happy man. Uh, it's a beautiful car. It deserves to be back on the road. He wants to enjoy the car, it's his pride and joy. He's owned it since 1990, I think. So, um, yeah, let's get stuck in. So when you come back to a job after spending a bit of time away, it's where do you start? So I'm gonna just jump straight back in there on the brakes. So you can see the configuration of the handbrake cable here. It runs along the body, through the prop shaft tunnel, all the way to the handle that operates the handbrake itself. And then when you look back, it runs through the wheel before connecting to the shoe. You can see here the pivot wheel is well gummed up, completely seized and obviously hasn't moved in years. So it's off with the shoes, off with the cable, And then this housing, like I've said before, over years it becomes powdery and brittle, so they usually break when you take them off. And as you know, things are never straightforward when things are rusted up and seized. These are the brake lines and hoses that run across the axle. So with these rusty old brake lines, I'm not going to take any chances. I'm going to err on the side of safety. So I've gone and purchased a brand new set, but I need to bend them into shape first before I fit them. You notice I clean and repaint as I work my way through. I just think it's pointless fitting brand new ancillaries to a rusty old hulk. So here we are again guys, a couple of months down the line. As I've said, I always like to finish what I've started. Uh, I never like to be beaten, as always. So since I've been away, Dan's been really busy. He's purchased quite a lot of parts, as you can see here. We've got um, anti-roll bars and bushes. Uh, there's a the couple of brake cylinders there that still need to fit. Um, we've got the rubbers for the front and rear bumpers where it goes through the body. There's new brake flexi hoses. There's a set of them. Wiper arms, wiper blades, uh, pivots, seals. Um, a brand new fuse box which cost them an absolute fortune from the classic sense. I think this was about, I think it was about $1,200, but listen, I suppose that's Dan's prerogative, he wants it perfect, so let's do our best. Also, brand new brake booster or servo units as we call it in the UK to replace this one. 
and um, just take a look at this. Now this is basically the brake reservoir, uh, clutch and brake reservoir where you put the fluid. Now this is the old one, it's, it's pretty battered and, and rusted up as you can see. Now I got in touch with the classic sensor and they said the part was no longer available and it had been superseded by this. <laughs> now for me guys, that doesn't really cut it. I mean, look at the state of that. That's the more modern version. But, you know, this is like a piece of jewellery, isn't it? Look at that. Okay, it's a copy part. I got it from vintage Euro parts, you know, the classic Mercedes place. And for me, that'll just be the cherry on the cake. And once I've taken the battery out, uh, replaced the brake booster, we've got a new fuse box, as I've said, over there. Strip it all back, repaint it all, and then put all the brand new ancillaries back in. It'll look an absolute treat. And that'll be the cherry on the cake, as I've said. And then it's nice and clean and maintainable, which is just the way we like it. I've also taken the liberty of purchasing a couple of these. Now, these go on the rear wheels. Let me just explain this. They have like a wheel inside. The handbrake cable goes through here and it pivots on this wheel. And these invariably get rusted up or gummed up with grease and, and crap and whatever else. So they always lock up. So when you put your handbrake on, it sticks on or it won't come off. These always break when you take them off. When I've done the 220SE up, when I've done the 113, the Pagoda up in the past, it's exactly what happened, because they're just cast alloy, really. And even though these are copies, they're very good copies, they're exactly the same to me. And they'll look and work a treat as well. So yeah, well, there's only one thing left to do, isn't there? As always, let's get stuck in. Now because I'm looking at this upside down, you'll notice I've fitted the brake bleed screw on the bottom instead of the top. <laughs> Remember, air always floats to the top, so I'll rectify this later. And this oval shaped washer goes on the outside of both the shoes before the bolt and thick washer finally goes on. Now this is the correct way around, at the top. Back on with the slippery little suckers. These springs are a pain in the ass. And on to the next one. Now you can see this is a lot dirtier than the last one. This cylinder's obviously been leaking. And again, get rid of all the filth so we can see what we're doing.
the old and the new. And take a look at these front ones, these are no better. 65 years of filth. Now in the previous episode it showed me doing one of these front ones. But now I'm going to show you a different way by removing the hub. It makes things an awful lot easier. See? Everything in there is just so much more accessible. I can jet wash all this off and detail it in a future episode, but for the time being, let's just get the car running and stopping and starting. And again, when you're tightening the main bolt, don't over tighten it, because you'll split the cast in half. And always make sure your tabs, one goes one way and the other to lock things in. Okay, so now I've finished most of the things underneath, like the brakes, and I've buzzed off quite a few bits, like the axle, and just basically clean things up so it's maintainable. Um, I'm going to move on to this now. Uh, as I said before, I'm going to. This is the next part of the brakes, you know, the brake servo unit, so that's got to be replaced. So I'm going to take this out, I'm going to remove the battery, the fuse box, which also needs replacing. And once it's all out, I'll clean it all out, buzz it all off, repaint it all then refit it with all the new ancillaries. Uh, but first things first, I've got to mask the car up because as you know, the spray and the dust and the dirt just gets everywhere and I don't want to ruin that interior before I'm, before I'm going to have to paint it. Um, so yeah. This is one of them horrible dirty jobs that none of us want to do. Come on, just dig in and do it properly. Now look at this huge bolt I've got to undo in order to remove the servo unit. Now without removing the entire steering column and limited tools, I suppose this is the best I can do. Oh, 
Oh, the joys. Now these shoddy old hoses you can see have been put in place of what should be a steel pipe that runs left to right across the bulkhead. But I suppose over 40, 50 years, these end up rusting and rotting away and falling apart. This is the main coolant pipe that runs from the engine to the heater mechanism. But of course, I'll put this back to stock with the correct new steel pipe. See that there? Like a little hole in this hose which goes underneath and goes to the brake servo unit or the booster. Um, and someone's just drilled a little hole there. And this is the vacuum hose that goes from the distributor into there with tape around it. High tech. Oh dear. Rubberized rubber that's been painted on to cover over the multiple sins. It's disgusting, look at that. You know what I liken it to? Have you ever watched the plumber go down a grid and clean out a toilet soil pipe and think I could never do that job? <laughs> well, this is one of them jobs. Okay, so we're going to take a little break, get out of the garage for the change and go to a little place called Griffith Park, which the last Sunday of every month, they have like a classic car meet, like a cars and coffee it is, like we have back in England. Um, listen, I might get there and there's three or four cars and <laughs> in which case I'll just turn around and go back to bed. But you never know, there might be some interesting stuff there and some nice people with interesting stories, which is what we like. So uh, you never know, let's see what's in store for us there. Now this is interesting, this is a Mercedes 250 SE, remember I had a, a 220 SE coupe in the past about 15 years ago and then it did a convertible, a cabriolet version, remember the silver one in one of the episodes going back a little bit. Now the 220 was sort of the first one out, then it was the 250, then they went to a 280, then they went to a 280 which wasn't a straight six, it went to a 3.5. I just want to show you something interesting, this is an original, see the way it's slightly wider? The curve's slightly different. You can see these clips here. One there, one there, one there, and one here. And they just slip onto the wheel nicely instead of them stupid, rigid kind of spikes that scratch your wheel to death. Anyway, that's the difference between a copy and an original. This is original, and I just think it's like 
so much nicer, it just pops the wheel completely. Whereas the other one, for me, just looks a little bit short, a little bit substandard, you know. Yeah, what a lovely car though. The 250s and the 300s had these, and they had a chrome strip down the side. I forgot to mention the 300 actually. Uh, that was a totally different engine altogether. And they've like skyrocketed now. They've really come up in price. But they're all the same car to look at. Just slightly different engineering, you know. Over and over and Have a look inside. I love these cars. See the beautiful wood dash. Gorgeous leather, cognac as well. It's, I think it's the best colour for the interior. And the price of the chrome on these cars, like Dan's 190 SL, it's just phenomenal. If you can get hold of it. It's a good trade off. 356. The one that got away. Now this is a rare thing. This actually looks like it's original paint. If you look here, unless this has been distressed and made to look like this, which you don't think it has, it looks like that was the original coat of paint from the factory. Difficult to tell really, but lovely little thing, whatever. I think this is a C. This is an interesting car. I mean, if this was in the UK, probably five years into its life, it was in a scrapyard. Because believe it or not, when these left the factory, they weren't even under sealed. They weren't even painted underneath. So by the time they were in the showroom, they'd already began to rust, which is, you know, incredible for the top of the range car at the time. But just look at them. They're just pure opulence, pure luxury. They look a little bit like a hearse, but look at this, this style and where it goes halfway across the wheel. Gorgeous. Unusual to see them in this original condition like this, but it's the climate. The city where the cars don't age, but the people do. <laughs> I certainly have anyway, on this 190 SL. But on a serious note, with any restoration when we have moments of deep despair, the thing that really keeps us going is the payoff at the end. The result is always worth it. There's something else that's caught me eye. I think yours is the best one here. Yeah. I've uh, never seen one, one of them before. One of these? Yeah. Yeah, well, they're fewer than, than there used to be. I mean, I had this for probably six or seven years, and I've done a bunch of mechanical work to it, but when I got it, it was somebody else had it, and they had repainted it and kind of tried to turn it into like a safari truck kind of thing. Yeah, I like this because it's still got the original wheels on, hasn't it? Yeah. Most people change them and, all right, you've got the Goodrich tyres on, which I think are the best ones for it, you know, for on-road and off-road, you know, if you're doing the two. Exactly. But um, it looks pretty stock, doesn't it? That's what I like about it. That's what attracted me to it. Yeah, it's pretty stock. Uh, original engine, original frame, mostly yeah, all, inside. go for it. Yeah, all original bits. It's just, you know, a lot of rust underneath there. See, I love these as well, the original steering wheel. It's yeah. Just, it's just really nice and like, just pops, you know. And most people change them out for smaller wheels. I restored one for my brother Lee. It was a 1977 Land Cruiser. And it was bright yellow and had wide wheels on it. It snapped all the steering on the front. You know, it just wasn't, it didn't have the right wheels for when the car was designed. Sure. It just been so messed about with, it was destroyed. And when it used to turn around corners, the body used to lift off and I come back down. Have you got that with this, it, yeah? It rolls a bit, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sharp turns are not the most fun. And uh, I haven't redone the suspension because I, I know that at some point I'm gonna have to do all new springs and everything. And right yeah. now it's just kind of like it's not a big gearing job, up you know. for the fresh. It's just not a massive job. It's not really anymore a, a, an off-road vehicle for me. I mean, I have other trucks that are more yeah. fun off-road, but Every once in a while, we'll take it down a dirt road and just get it dirty, and and it it holds up incredibly well. I the, mean, the Australians love these. Yeah, yeah. I, I went into a place when I was getting bits with my brothers, and there was one. It was a grey one, and they bought it from a guy in Australia. Who, when he was 25 and he started work on you know on the range, whatever, he it was it was supplied to him new, and he had it all his work and life. And when yeah. he retired, he sold it, and it was 
it was just so original, never yeah. been messed about with, you know, and been a fantastic workhorse his whole life. I couldn't have parted with something like that. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the way we feel. We're going to keep it forever. It's because it's got the original frame and engine and everything like that. We do know the original colors. It was a red and white. So at some point we're going to put it back to the red and white. It's just, we know there's probably a lot of rust work that needs to be done under there once we do I'd it. leave this and just do that red. Yeah. And what you might notice here too is what's missing. And this is the drip rail. Yeah. It's been, and been removed, hasn't it's it? been removed. And that's because these 55s have a ton of rust through here. Yeah. So I assume when he was working on it, he thought the easiest way to do it would be to remove the drip rail and just clean it but, up. But they were there for a reason, the drip rail. I well, mean, you, you might take them notice off, you just get all the water. The water all here. goes through. Yeah. And that's why there's water on yeah. my uh, floor mat there. So I've actually got drip rail to put on it. And I'm going to do it when I repaint it. But it's all part of the, the, overhaul when we do well, it. Have you done these? I haven't done them, no, but I have them. I have a whole kit of rubber. There's basically Diesel original. Engine, yeah. No, this is a straight six. This is the, in 75, they went from the uh, 1F to the 2F engine. So this is yeah. the 2F, which went from, so they went from three speed to four speed. So I have the whopping four speed, which gets me up to 55 or 60 on the yeah. highway. Wow. <laughs> you know? But it's a, yeah, it's the original four speed transmission. And this was the first year of that. Um, These weren't built for speed, though. The no, horses. they weren't. No. I don't, I don't know how old you are, Mark. How yeah, old are you? I'm mid forties. Mid forties. Yeah. 40s, 40s, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a few years on you, but um, I think back in the seventies there was like a commercial, which were basically putting them out as the best four wheel drive in the world, and they used to show them literally driving up walls almost, you yeah. know, slowly. Yeah. And I think back then and even now. They stood the test of time. They're probably up there with the best four-wheel drives in the world, aren't they? Absolutely. Like I said, we've never done anything too aggressive with it, but we've taken it out on dirt roads, and it flops around, and it's it rolls, but it's it's sort of like an old, you know, Series 1 or 2 Land Rover. It's like you can just drive them across anything, and they really just soak it up. Does but, the missus drive it, or does she like, I'm not driving that thing? You know, you'd be surprised. She was the one who, who spotted it originally, and she did drive it. It's good. Yeah. It's I mean, plus. she's it's got a lot bonus. of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't drive it that much, but, you know, she, she uh, back in her day, she had a, uh, a Rambler, so she still loves a wagon. Anything that's a wagon with a stick, yeah. she, she'll give it a go. The wonderful thing about this Cars and Coffee is, as opposed to West Side LA, where you're going to see every flavor of supercar, every new, you might see a Bugatti, you might see 10 Porsche GT3s. Yeah. Yeah. Here, you're gonna see a whole sloth of vintage cars in all kinds of shapes. Yeah. Some nice restored, mix. some just getting you know, started, some barely running, and it's, it's enthusiasts of all kinds of cars. You see a whole mini group over there, a whole vintage Mustang group, a whole Mercedes group see, up that, there. See, that's the difference. They're not just showing off with cars. No, they actually it's take a lot enthusiast. of pride in the vehicles they drive and they yeah. wear them. Oh, very proud. And and this is where people come to show off, you know, the things that all of us kind of want to see, yeah. you know, the, uh, and these and are the cars of, that... none of them are quite perfect. No, nothing's people perfect People clean here. them, they put a lot of, you know, they're very fastidious, they put a lot of work and, uh, you know, just to come and show the car. And yeah chew the fat and, and mix stories, you know, yeah. it's, it's lovely. I mean, as you walk around, you see co you see their coffee cups sitting on top of them and people yeah. hanging out and anybody will show your car and half the time you see somebody jumping in to drive somebody's car. It's just a really nice yeah. cars and coffee and, and we've been really lucky to have it. It's really taken off in the last few years and I think it's because of that spirit of, you know, more everyday driver cars, Yeah, you know. Look, thanks so much for showing me. Yeah, nice and to meet you. And it's the best car here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Well, I said it was the best one here. It sort of feasted my eyes upon this beautiful 1960s Ford Galaxy. Oh, well, look at the driver. It's the one and only Mr. Jay Leno, a self-confessed classic car nut. He was a big supporter of these meets, and I believe he's a really amiable guy who will chew the fat about classic cars all day long. So refreshed and re-inspired, I head back off to the garage to carry on. Just as I'm leaving, the perfect cap on a perfect morning. I have a quick little shunge with a couple of pugs. <laughs> it's like home from home. Thank you for watching this episode of Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like and subscribe. And join me next time when you can share in the spoils of my hard work 
and let's finally get this car out in the open.